This is screencast number three for chapter six. And we'll be talking about something called the atomic line spectra. Now, as you've probably observed, you know that if you've ever seen fireworks, the fireworks come in different colors, and we talked about them at the beginning of the chapter. And maybe you've seen somebody or you, you yourself have purchased various salts at a hardware store, for example, and you throw some of those salts into the fire at a campfire or in the grill, and you get different colors of flame. You might also recall doing a lab in first year chemistry where you have some popsicle sticks, wooden um, splints that were soaking in salts of different types. And when you put it into flame, the flame produced different colors. And you might also remember in that lab that you had various gas discharge tubes. Those were tubes that kind of looked like this very skinny and then thick. And you put them into a box where the electricity could go through. And you got light from that middle part of the tube, a gas discharge tube. And each tube was filled with a different gas. And when you zapped it with electricity, you got different colors. So the purpose of this screencast is to answer several questions. Number one, why is it that when you provide a lot of energy via fire or electricity to something, you get light, why is that light colored and why do you get a different color for different types of elements or salts? So back to our um, idea here. Um, it, with the gas discharge tube, we provide a high voltage. Now, you learn more about voltage in a unit on electricity later, but voltage is the potential energy that the charge has um, in order to travel through a conductor or even a non-conductor. It doesn't take an awful lot of voltage to get a charge to move through a conducting material like copper in a wire. It takes an awful lot of voltage to get a charge like a lightning bolt or even a spark to travel through a non-conductor like air. So if you apply a high voltage to a tube and there's a elemental gas in this tube like neon, argon, xenon, um, neon, or maybe even some other gas like carbon dioxide, or N2 nitrogen gas, H2 hydrogen gas, O2 oxygen gas, what happens is that the gas in that uh, glass container um, begins to glow with light. And what we think is happening, and as that will become apparent as we go through this screencast, that the atoms absorb the energy in particular, the mobile electrons around each atom, uh, because of that energy, get excited and um, either the atoms or the electrons um, are going to pick up that energy. The atoms then can uh, vibrate very, very rapidly, or as we will see, the electrons that are uh, in various positions around the nucleus will jump out to higher energy levels, and when those electrons fall back, uh, they give off uh, their energy, in the in at, some of it at least, in the visible part of the spectrum. You've no doubt seen this with some of the uh, neon signs, and of course they use other gases besides neon um, in order to advertise things. Now, what we know is that if you take this light that is coming from the discharge tube or coming from the flame that you've put some salts or a popsicle stick that's been soaking in some um, solution of salts. And, and you take look at that flame through a prism or more likely a diffraction grating. 
a diffraction grating would look something like this. It would look almost like it's black, except it would have extremely fine lines etched in it, maybe made by a very, very, very sharp razor blade. And as that light goes through that opening, and so now I'm gonna look at it on the side, so here's an opening, okay? And this line right there represents that space. As the light comes through and strikes the diffraction grating, it bends. That's diffraction. And then if you have multiple openings, let's say there's another one here, there's another opening right there, then you're gonna get bending of the light as it goes through that opening and so forth and so forth. And as a result, you notice places where there is interference and places where there is cancellation. And that pattern is what we call an emission spectrum. And that emission spectrum um, corresponds, um, it can be related to the wavelength of the light that is entering and passing through the diffraction grating or the prism. Now, of course, if you have white light, uh, say, coming from the atmosphere, and that white light goes through the prism or diffraction grating, you will get an entire rainbow of color. But if you have the light from a particular atom going through the diffraction grating or through the prism, then you actually do not see a rainbow of color, but you see a specific color. And uh, the diffraction grating will actually break that color down into its component wavelengths. So, very important to notice that every element has a unique emission spectrum. That means that you can use this spectrum in, in order to identify an unknown element. So there are lots of applications um, of that analytical procedure. So if you um, had a uh, painting uh, from centuries ago and you needed to analyze the, the paint on that to see if maybe it, it's a forgery and is really recent or if it, is, it is, is indeed ancient, you can take a, just an ever so small bit of that paint, dissolve it in a solution, inject it into a device that will turn the solution into a vapor, you pass light through that vapor, and you get spectral lines indicating um, the elements that make up that particular kind of paint. You can do the same thing, for example, with um, powders that you might find at the scene of a crime or some unknown substance you've isolated from food or beverage, or maybe you're looking at soil or a water sample in the environment and you extract some unknown substance. This is a way of identifying it because every single element creates a very unique set of spectral lines. So here's a diagram showing that process. In this case, we're using a gas discharge tube, um, which already is front loaded with hydrogen gas, as opposed to uh, a sample that you might have put in that you're trying to identify. So we pass our light through a system of screens which have a single slit in it, which will help to focus the light. So instead of the light coming all over the place, we're getting a single beam going through the slit, and then it hits the prism or the diffraction grating. The diffraction grating would be right here, and that's going to spread that light out into its component colors. And you'll notice in the case of hydrogen, there's a couple in the blue, there's one in the green, there's one down here in the reddish orange. And in fact, um, if we had the right analytical uh, re receiving device over here, uh, a photo cell coupler or um, something that is solid state or even photographic film perhaps, you might see that there's also some spectral lines in the ultraviolet at this end, which you can't see, um, but you can detect, or maybe in the infrared on this side. This is called a line spectrum because in this picture you have one, two, three, four lines 
that form this spectrum. It's not a continuous spectrum like a rainbow, but it's a line spectrum. And um, a century ago, a little more than a century ago, a guy named Balmer uh, came up with a mathematical equation for this relating um, why we get these different spectral lines uh, to the incoming wavelength of light. So here's your incoming wavelength of light that's coming in, and it corresponds to um, electrons when, we made, when they made the connection that have been energized and have jumped out to higher energy levels, and as they fall back to another energy level, um, they're going to produce a, a, spec, a particular spectral line. So in this case, we have an electron falling from the nth level down to the second energy level. And it turns out that all um, electrons, when they fall back to the second energy level, produce spectral lines in the visible part of the spectrum and so this is called the Balmer series. So if you think of a nucleus right here being made up of protons and neutrons, I'm representing it by a big dot for simplicity's sake. And we have an energy level, an energy level, another energy level. If an electron is falling back to the second from the third, so n would equal three. Or if I have another energy level, an electron is falling from the fourth back to the second, so n would equal four. All electrons that have been um, excited when they fall back to the second energy level are going to produce spectral lines in the visible part of the, part of the spectrum. But of course, now you might say, well, what about electrons that fall all the way back to the first, um, from the, maybe from the second energy level, or from the third, or from the fourth? Do those produce spectral lines? And the answer is yes, they do. They're higher energy, they represent a higher energy because they're falling um, much farther. Uh, and uh, they're not going to be visible, though. They're going to be in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. And then you might say, well, what about electrons that fall only back to the uh, third energy level? So if I draw another energy level and I have electron going from the fourth down to the third, or maybe from the fifth down to the third. What about them? Well, those don't release as much energy. Uh, they're starting farther away from the nucleus in the first place, uh, which is the third. And when they get a little bit of energy, it's not all that difficult to be excited out to the fourth or excited out to the fifth. So when they fall back again, because it's more stable to fall back, once the um, source of energy has been removed, it's not quite as much energy. It's less energy than in the visible and less energy in the ultraviolet. In other words, it would be infrared in this part. So I just explained the Balmer series. I should mention that this constant right here, R, is called the Rydberg constant, named obviously after a guy named Rydberg. So, the way Niels Bohr, um, a German, and I think he's Dutch, but uh, again, uh, grew up, uh, or, yeah, Danish. He grew up Lutheran, but um, in that particular period of time, especially during World War II and Germany, um, the Lutheran Church, again, was um, substantially compromised, tragically, and um, he basically abandoned his uh, Lutheran uh, background and upbringing. I don't know that how much he ever embraced it in the first place, but in any case, he proposed what we think of as the planetary structure of an atom, that the nucleus is at the center of an atom, just like a uh, sun is at the center of a solar system, and the electrons are in orbit around the sun, held gravitationally in place, just like the electrons are in orbit around the nucleus, held electrostatically in place by the protons in the nucleus. Now, of course, there's a big difference between an atom and a uh, solar system, not just because of the source of the attraction, 
but because an atom is three-dimensional, so instead of thinking about planar orbits, in other words, on a surface, we need to think about shells um, nested in in each other, three-dimensional spheres, hollow spheres, with the smaller sphere inside a larger sphere, inside a larger sphere, with at the center uh, being the nucleus. And there are some other things going on as well that we'll mention in a minute. In any case, that this means that when we look at hydrogen, we can now find a correspondence between um, this wavelength and whether and and the electron as it falls from one energy level all the way down to the second. And this is falling from a different energy level down to the second, and down to the second, and down to the second, and so forth. And of course, there are ones that are in the ultraviolet area and ones in the infrared area that we're not showing here. If we look at mercury gas, um, which, which you looked at, all three of these you looked at in your first year of chemistry, you'll notice that the mercury um, spectral lines uh, are different than the hydrogen spectral lines, and the neon spectral lines are different from mercury and hydrogen. And the conclusion is that every element has an absolutely unique set of spectral lines. Now, you might say, if all these spectral lines represent electrons falling back to the second energy level, why aren't the spectral lines the same for every element? Because every element has the same um, numbered energy levels of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc., And the reason is those energy levels are in different places for different elements. For example, hydrogen, and I'll use a smaller circle for that, um, because it only has one proton, its energy levels are going to be kind of close. But for mercury, which is going to have a lot of protons, I'll represent the nucleus with the bigger dot, its energy levels are going to be um, in a different location. They're actually going to be a little bit closer than it is for hydrogen, and so forth. Um, Plus, mercury has a lot more electrons than hydrogen does, and so you're going to get a lot more different combinations. So the point we're trying to make is that these energy levels are in different places for different elements because of the fact uh, that they have different amount of positive charge in the nucleus. Um, And as we continue to think about Uh, this process here. It's really uh, providential. Uh, God loves color, and he loves different kinds of color, and he loves to give us tools to investigate his creation. And uh, so every single element is going to have a unique set of spectral lines. We can discern what that element is from its unique combination of spectral lines. And um, we should also point out, and this will become important a little later, is that for a given element with a nucleus right there, the first energy level is a certain distance, whatever that might be, uh, from the nucleus, but the second energy level is not twice as far away. It's not. The second energy level is a little bit, it's more than the first, but not twice as much as the first. And so as you go farther and farther away from the nucleus, the energy levels get closer and closer to each other. Now, this conception of an atom contradicts classical physics because we would think that as these electrons that have jumped out to higher energy um, levels, as they lose their energy in, by get, emitting light, and falling back, they should fall all the way back to the positive nucleus. Or, if nothing else, that electron, when it's in this energy level, should spiral into the nucleus, collapsing the atom, and then the atom, of course, would not be able to undergo chemical reactions or form compounds, and therefore there would not be um, any chemistry, there would not be any compounds, there would not obviously be any life. So it's absolutely essential somehow 
to explain why the electrons don't spiral into the nucleus, because the nucleus is positive and the electron is negative. Um, but nevertheless, despite that um, question that needed to be answered by Bohr, Bohr, he introduced what we call the quantization, uh, quantization um, of the electronic structure that the electrons can only absorb enough energy. Let's uh, draw the, I'm going to erase this picture. And the electrons, if this is my nucleus, can and this is the first energy level, can only absorb a certain amount of energy to make it to the next energy level. Or they can only absorb a certain amount of energy level to make it two energy levels out. But they cannot absorb um, half of that energy or a little bit more than half. In other words, it either absorbs just the right packet of energy to jump one energy level or two energy levels, or three energy levels, but never part way. And that implies that this energy comes in chunks, or packets, or quanta, or photons. And so, since you can't absorb, the electron can't absorb, part of a quanta or photon, a fraction of a quanta or photon, it either absorbs the photon or it doesn't. And of course, the amount of energy a photon has depends upon its wavelength, which is inversely proportional to its frequency. And so this begins to say that energy is not something that is like an analog scale. Think of a, a um, speedometer in the dashboard of your car. And there's the arrow, and it's 10, 20, 30. And the arrow seems to smoothly be able to go back and forth as you accelerate and deaccelerate. Um, technically, um, what's happening is you can only have this speed or this speed or this speed or this speed, but the, um, the speeds or the energy values that the electrons have um, are small enough that, you, that they correspond to the wavelengths of light. We cannot sense that when we're riding in a car. Technically speaking, um, if you could sense it, then the car would feel like it's rather herky-jerky, kind of jumping um, in these little small um, leaps, if you will, if you could actually sense that small of a number, which, of course, we can't, as you accelerate and deaccelerate. Now, uh, Bohr's equation, here it is, again, the total, this is equation for... Um, calculating the total amount of energy, an extension of, of Bohr's previous equation. And that the total amount of energy depends upon the speed of light, Planck's constant, which we've talked about before, and Rydberg's constant from the previous equation, and then this letter n down here, which is squared, um, is a whole number. It's either a 1, 2, 3, etc., and you'll notice the negative sign because it's exo. This is energy being emitted as the electron falls back. And, of course, you could combine all three constants into one grand constant if you wanted to. But the very fact that n here is a whole number and not a part, of a fraction of a number, means that my energy comes in certain discrete values or chunks. Now, that letter N, that number is very important in quantum chemistry. It's called the principal quantum number. It's called quantum number one. And we would expand, expound on that to call it energy level number one, or energy level number two, or energy level number three. And this is part of beginning to discern where is the electron um, located about a given atom. It's the biggest part of the address, kind of like I think almost all of you likely live in the state of Missouri. Uh, that's a big part of your address, but of course you live, um, we need to identify where you live uh, more precisely than that, and that's why we need more quantum numbers besides just the first one. 
The first quantum number is probably the number you might have learned as far back, let's say, as eighth grade. So let's take a, a look over here on the left. And here you can see that if my nucleus is somewhere down here, that the first energy level will be at some distance from the nucleus, but then you've got this big gap before the second, not so big a gap to get to the third, an even smaller gap to get to the fourth, and the farther and farther away you are from that positive pole of the nucleus, the closer together are those energy levels. So let's take a look at these bullet points. Number one, the quantum number n defines the energies of the allowed orbits in the hydrogen atom. The reason I underline the hydrogen atom is because, interestingly enough, everything that I'm saying is about just the hydrogen atom. The helium atom gets maybe too complicated to look at it, at it this simplistically. So we as chemists and scientists feel pretty good about ourselves, pat ourselves in the back, look how much we know about the hydrogen atom. And then we look at the periodic table and say, you know, there's a little bit more to go. We're not quite there yet. There are a few more elements. I mentioned the negative value because it's exothermic. And then by the time you get an infinite distance away, you know, energy level 100 or 1000 or whatever, for all intents and purposes, you've separated the electron from the nucleus entirely. And you might remember from first year chemistry, that would be called the ionization energy, the amount of energy it takes to remove an electron from an atom. Um, the ground state is where the electrons start off. This is the stable state before they have been energized. Um, states of, for the hydrogen atom with higher energies, in other words, energy levels beyond one, since hydrogen only has one electron, that one electron is in its ground state of n equals one. So any energy level beyond one would be an excited state. And when we get to, let's say, lithium, where you have three electrons, two would be in the first energy level, the third would be in the second energy level. So its excited state for the third electron of lithium would be any n greater than two. And the energy is dependent on this inverse square law, inverse square law, which is why those energy levels um, get closer and closer together, as I showed over here, <coughs> as you get farther from the nucleus. Now, if we look at a math problem, it says calculate the energies of n equal 1 and n equal 2 states of the hydrogen atom. How much energy is that electron going to have when it falls from the second down to the first? And that math problem just requires us to plug our numbers in. We can do this in joules per atom, and then we can multiply by Avogadro's number to get kilojoules per mole. Um, that's the amount of energy in the first energy level. And then we can look at the second energy level. And notice when we go to the second energy level, these two numbers are different. So therefore, these two numbers are different. And the difference in these two energies, the delta E, this change in energy, is 984 kilojoules per mole. That's a total amount of energy that must be absorbed to jump from the first out to the second, or the total amount of energy that would be released when it falls from the second back to the first. So again, we're just simply moving these electrons via electricity or heat um, farther away, and then they're falling back. And, you can, and because energy comes in packets, um, and it's not nice and smooth. Um, that means that um, uh, you either get the, get the a whole chunk and can jump, or you don't have enough and you don't jump at all. So when we look over here, again, this picture sort of shows the electron jumping out to an excited state. Keep in mind that these energy levels would be um, more like this curve with a nucleus somewhere down here. Uh, but for the sake of the picture, they're written, uh, drawn as straight lines. Um, so you apply energy, it jumps out. When it falls back, it gives up that energy in, with a particular wavelength 
that corresponds to a particular spectral line. Some of the spectral lines are in the visible, some of the spectral lines are in the invisible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Make sure you pay attention to the negative sign. You can also use the word emitted. If I were you, I would use both the negative sign to show that the energy is being emitted and use the word emitted when I use, use my answer in a sentence to describe what has happened. Now, the names of these other series, um, you have the Lyman series, which is when it falls back to the first energy level. And so that would be the ultraviolet because that would represent higher energy than the Balmer. And ultraviolet is beyond blue. It's a higher energy. Ultraviolet has enough energy to sunburn or skin cancer. And the passion series is when N equals three. Uh, that name is not given, into your, in, given to you in the book. Now, is there a name for falling back to the fourth and the fifth and the sixth? Yes, but... Um, we're not going to worry about that. So here's an even better picture showing how we get the different spectral lines, especially in the visible part of the spectrum. Um, these particular wave, uh, spectral lines correspond to these particular wavelengths, and that corresponds to electrons falling from the sixth or the fifth or the fourth or the third down into the second. Now, again, there are other problems with this conception of the atom and its structure um, that we will talk about later. Here's another problem, um, plugging our numbers in. I just wanted to point out a mistake that I hope you don't make. Do not think when you're doing this part of the math that you can just say 1 4th minus 16, 1 16th equals 1 12th. That is not true. That is not true. Um, uh, you have to um, take one-fourth, convert that into a decimal, and then subtract, uh, I should say one-fourth, then subtract your um, one-sixteenth to get an answer to put in those parentheses. And when you do that, you can find the wavelength. Another trick, when you see math problems like this, and you will on homework or test, please note that to be in the visible part of the spectrum, you must be somewhere between 400 and 700, and I'm rounding off, nanometers. Somewhere before, between 400 and 700 nanometers. If you're expected to be in the visible part of the spectrum and you're getting an answer that is outside this range, you've probably made a math mistake somewhere. And we're gonna stop right there. <laughs>